Murdered for doing his job, another respected Mexican journalist is gunned down after years of covering the cartels. Why are the killings increasing? And are authorities doing enough to prevent them? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Sami Zaydan. Mexico is not a war zone, and yet it's one of the most dangerous places in the world for reporters. Prominent journalist Javier Valdez is the latest of several members of the media who've been killed this year alone. The Committee to Protect Journalists says widespread impunity allows criminal gangs, corrupt officials and cartels to silence their critics. The Mexican government has repeatedly promised to protect journalists and freedom of expression. But the shootings and beatings continue. We'll get to our guests in just a moment, but first Whitney Hurst has this report on Valdez's life and legacy. He was one of the most revered journalists in Mexico. Javier Valdez's murder, just one block from his office, has shocked the journalist community. He was known for his work covering drug trafficking and organized crime in the northern state of Sinaloa, home to the powerful Sinaloa drug cartel. Valdez was a correspondent for Mexico's national newspaper, La Jornada, and helped many international media outlets cover the drug war. In 2011, he told Al Jazeera about the risks journalists face while doing their job. You have to know the ground beneath your feet, who has the power. Who is killing people in the street? Who distributes the drugs? What accomplices does he have within the government? How does he work? You need this information in order to know what you're going to publish, and most importantly, what not to publish. Colleagues at Rio Doce, a publication he helped found, say he was driving in broad daylight when he was forced from his car and shot dead in the middle of the street. Mexican President Enrique Peña Nieto called his murder an outrageous crime. Prosecutors are investigating his killing and looking into whether it was linked to his profession. The fame of a journalist is not important. Those who want to kill and cause damage will do it, and they can do it with impunity. This is an attack not just on him, but also an attack on journalism and all journalists throughout Mexico. The Committee to Protect Journalists says Mexico has become one of the most dangerous places in the world for journalists. But Valdez kept working despite the threats. I continue to write. This is my passion. This is my work. I take antidepressives, sleeping pills. I need them. But this is my passion. To stop writing would be like dying. To stay quiet would make me an accomplice. Javier Valdez is at least the fifth reporter killed in the last three months. His death has saddened many here and left journalists wondering if they are next. Whitney Hurst for Inside Story. Now, earlier this month, the Mexican president, Enrique Peña Nieto, met the Committee to Protect Journalists. He promised to prioritize reporter safety. Valdez's death comes just two weeks after that pledge, and it's prompting some Twitter reaction from the president. He said he condemns the murder and has authorized the special prosecutor for crimes against freedom of expression to support the investigation of this outrageous crime. He goes on to say, I reiterate our commitment to the freedom of expression and press, fundamental parts of our democracy. Let's take a closer look at some of the dangers faced by journalists in Mexico then. Just a few days ago, seven journalists in Guerrero State were assaulted by gunmen, beaten and robbed of their equipment. In April, the newspaper Norte shut down after one of its reporters was killed. The Committee to Protect Journalists says 41 Mexican reporters have been murdered since 1992 for doing their jobs. And the CPJ blames criminal gangs for six out of ten of those deaths. Let's bring our guests into the show then. We have in San Diego, David Shirk, Associate Professor of Political Science and International Relations at the University of San Diego. In Boston, Miguel Bathanez, former Mexican ambassador to the United States. And in Washington, Stephen Dudley, the co-director of Insight, an initiative aimed at monitoring organized crime in the Americas. Welcome to you all. If I could start with Stephen, why are so many journalists being killed in Mexico? 
Well, I think it's a combination of factors, but what we are seeing is a general degradation of of the of the ability of the government to deal with criminal groups um, and their the, the the space that the journalists can operate in is being squeezed more and more. Why, why and are they unable to deal with criminal groups, Stephen? Though. Well, there there's been some successes. There's been some successes in the sense that they've been able to um, decapitate, if you will, many of the larger organizations. And what we've seen over time is an atomization process where the criminal groups are. Are, there are more and more criminal groups. There are less and less sort of monolithic or large criminal groups. So you get these kind of chaotic situations in which people like Javier Valdez have to operate. They're not sure what the rules are. They're not sure who they're offending. Um, and, and it puts them in incredibly precarious positions and obviously deadly positions. So there's, there's this sort of cascading effect uh, that comes from this general degradation of the, of the situation, and, and it, it cascades down into the journalism field. All right. Uh, let's bring in uh, Ambassador Miguel into the discussion, if uh, we could. And uh, this, I, I guess what we're heading towards is some kind of conclusion that perhaps the war against these cartels is not working, or at least is not working in the way intended when it comes to protecting journalists, Ambassador. Uh, I agree with what Stephen is mentioning, but it's important to put this in context. The main problem is the market that the U.S., with a very high demand on drugs and a very relaxed position about arms, because the arms that the guns are using in Mexico are coming from the U.S. to Mexico, and then you have also the laundering, the money laundering problem. So. Uh, at least in the past, with President Obama, we had an administration in the U.S. that was concerned on working together with Mexico on combating organized crime. But now with this administration, that is not been the case. So Mexico is facing a very hostile American president nowadays, plus the presidential election of Mexico next year, and on top of that, the organized by national crime, because this is not a Mexican problem, this is a, a common American and Mexican problem. Uh, Ambassador, so, some human rights groups might say it is partly at least a Mexican problem. They say there's a lack of political will within Mexico. Is it only about what's going on on the, the U.S. side of the border? No, it is your right. It's, of course, a big Mexican problem. And that goes into the many different, what Stephen was saying, in the past you had uh, five, six, seven um, very powerful organized groups, criminal groups. Now you have many, many, and as much as the government keeps on trying to decapitate the, those powerful ones, then many more comes up. But the source, the reason, the energy, the money for these groups to keep on going is in the U.S. market. That is why it's so important to deal with this problem by nationally. Uh, that right. does not excuse and justifies in any way the, the problems that Mexico is facing. And in there, what you have is many political currents under the three main parties that many of those may get some benefits from dealing with these guys right. and they operate at the local level. We'll come back to the local authorities and the, the federal authorities in a minute, but David, are these killings, I guess the ultimate question is, are these killings preventable? Are authorities failing? Uh, so I, I think uh, hopefully every killing is preventable, um, but, you know, the, the situation that uh, my, my esteemed guests, um, uh, Ambassador uh, uh, Basanez and, and Stephen Dudley, have described are really complex. And I think it's, it's difficult to, in a, in a short 
uh, and succinct way summarize what are the many different factors and conditions involved here. But I think that the, the fundamental problem, uh, and to speak to the question, uh, the fundamental problem in Mexico is the problem of impunity. Uh, long before the, the uh, increase in violent deaths that we've seen over the last decade, uh, really starting about 15, 16 years ago, our organization started looking at Mexico's criminal justice system and, and found that there is this incredibly high rate of impunity uh, because of a lack of, of professionalism and integrity in law enforcement uh, and in the administration of justice. So that's where the problems lie on the Mexican side. But there's no but doubt. Break some of those, the, David, if I could jump in. Break some of those terms out. down. When you say lack of professionalism, are, are you basically saying you found evidence of collusion at some level between authorities and drug cartels? So in, integrity is, is really the opposite of corruption, right? And I think that there are serious problems of corruption in Mexico. Uh, they're well recognized, well documented, uh, and they exist at, at practically all levels, uh, which is, is challenging and scary, particularly when we're talking about uh, Mexican drug cartels. Um, but the other part of the problem, of course, uh, is that um, there's not a, uh, a mechanism to pr promote uh, professional merit-based advancement in many parts of the Mexican criminal justice system. And that's, that's really where Mexico needs to make its transition. But our responsibility, I think, here in the United States and, and in much of the developed world uh, is the problem of drug consumption and, and the market for drugs and how we manage it. And prohibition, frankly, hasn't been a very successful strategy for the last 40 years. And it's led to a lot of incarcerations and deaths. Uh, and that's what we're seeing uh, now in Mexico, as we saw in Colombia before. And, and in many parts of the United States. Let me uh, turn this question back to Ambassador Miguel. The, the Committee to Protect Journalists is saying, quote, the collusion between the government and organized crime, yes, it's a factor. It's blocking the possibility of investigators ever getting to the bottom of these cases. That statement there by Carlos Lauria, the CPJ senior program coordinator for the Americas. Is he right? Uh, you, you find in many state governments these kind of collusions, and it's very important that the federal government keeps on trying to solve that. But as probably the worst case in the last few years was the state of Veracruz, where I'm from, and that governor is the one that set a really very bad, uh, very bad background on that with many journalists being killed. And as, uh, as David was saying, the problem with impunity is the main thing. So this has been evolving. Now, I know President Peña has been trying to really stop this, but the problem is really complex and without a, an important collaboration with intelligence and strategies and working both sides of the border, the U.S. and Mexico, that makes it well, much... What, what is tying the hands of the president, Ambassador Miguel? I mean, this is obviously such an important topic. The president himself is on the record as saying this is a basic uh, functioning of, of a democracy. Why, is, why are federal authorities unable to deal with state governors if there's any I, evidence that they're perhaps somehow uh, tied to these crimes? Or, or I would make a parallel to what President Obama was trying to do to stop the arms trade. In every killing in the U.S., President Obama tried hard to make the laws against arms harder, and he couldn't because the lobbying of the... Rifle Association and the arms industry is so powerful in the U.S. that he could not stop it. In Mexico, something similar happened, except that the lobbying is not open and those collusions are not legal. And then what you have is very powerful groups, very low in the in the hierarchy in the in the county level in the state level in some uh, federal offices that the president is trying to stop but i am i know him and i know that he's trying to do that and that he feels really frustrated by right. these kind of killings keeping on going that that's that's the same frustration that president obama was feeling in every killing of children in the U.S. All right, let, let's put this into back into context, uh, Stephen. Um, 
it seems from when you read about the cases of journalists being killed that the most common punishment is actually nothing. Is that in fact the case? That is absolutely the case, and that has been the case over a many year period. So for, uh, for us to sort of look at the, the, the attacks on journalism, on journalists, and to point the finger at the United States and to talk about consumption and to talk about drug trafficking, I think it is to point it in the wrong direction. We need to point it in the direction of the politicians. It's in the hands of the politicians, and in many cases, it is directly in the hands of the politicians. These murders are at least as, as related to actions or investigations into politicians as they are against narcos. So it's a, it's a completely, it's a misdirection, if you will, to point it, you know, towards the United States, to, to talk about parallels with the United States. In addition to that, we've got to consider that the criminal economy in Mexico is not just the criminal economy that's dependent on trafficking drugs to the United States. This is a criminal economy that does all kinds of local criminal activities. And in fact, many of these atomized groups, these smaller groups, depend on what they earn inside of Mexico. So again, that is a misdirection that I am in disagreement with. So I would focus it on the politicians, as David said, their inability to sort of break this system of impunity that has been created over many, many years. And then, and then let's, let's think about who these criminal groups are. These criminal groups are operating on a local level. They have local revenue streams that they are trying to secure, not just international revenue streams. Okay, well, before we, uh, I want to go to David in, in a second, but I just want to give Ambassador maybe to come back in on some of those points uh, which you uh, disagreed with, Stephen, and particularly ask the question, Ambassador, just briefly, if it's really a federal versus a state issue, the Federal Prosecutor's Office has been accused by the CPJ, the Committee to Protect Journalists, of having a poor record itself in successfully investigating these sorts of crimes. Why? Is there, is there not more responsibility even at the, the feet of the federal authorities, as, as Stephen might say? I agree on the poor record, but I disagree on not uh, pointing to the U.S. Uh, blame on what it is and the sharing of intelligence and the strategies to work together. Now, it is also true, as Stephen is saying, that this impunity has been uh, uh, getting worse, and also that the organized, well, I, I should say this organized crime in Mexico, the organized crime is in the U.S., in Mexico is the disorganized, it has moved from drugs into many other forms, extortion, right. kidnapping, uh, many forms of violence. I agree on that, but I disagree on not sharing the the uh, okay. on both sides. All right, uh, David, what sort of message is being sent to the media by killing journalists like Javier Valdez? Is it impacting the ability of journalists to cover the story, to get information to the public? You know, I'm not, I'm not a journalist, uh, of course, but I, I have I've talked to many journalists in Mexico, and, and I do think that it uh, impairs their ability to play uh, the, the role they need to in, in a functional democracy. Um, journalists uh, have to be very careful to, uh, to, to self-censor. Uh, in, in many cases, we, in, in, in the case of the journalists we work, to, work with to track the number, just the number of homicides in Mexico associated with organized crime. Uh, I know that organizations have had to cut back on their efforts to actually document and track uh, the uh, execution style killings and other organized crime uh, related killings. And so there is absolutely an effect of, of the crackdown on journalists. But I want to just, if, if I may, insert my own point uh, in response to Stephen's very strong point that uh, there are many internal problems in Mexico. Uh, I would just point out that uh, in, in many ways, uh, you know, if you took drugs away from the equation in Mexico, uh, there would still be many, many problems. But the, the magnitude of crime and violence that we would see there uh, would, be, would, would be much less. And, and I, as a U.S. citizen, I think it's very important that we recognize the impact that the war on drugs has in Mexico. Stephen, I, I know, uh, recognizes this uh, as What's well. What's the alternative, uh, his then? Point is What's the well alternative, taken. David, then? Well, 
If we were to legalize drugs overnight, there'd be a lot of unemployed criminals in Mexico, and they would continue to engage in criminal activities, but they'd most likely be predatory activities focused on uh, ordinary citizens. Uh, so there would still be a need for, for this rule of law. That, that uh, would have other negative, uh, obviously, consequences uh, to society, though, surely. You're not, you're not advocating that, especially hard drugs. Uh, I think if we were to if we were to legalize, first of all, yeah, we've we've already legalized marijuana, and effectively that has taken away business from the cartels and led them into some of these other activities that that Stevens pointed out. Um, but look, we have to figure out a way to manage heroin uh, not by controlling supply, but by helping the people who are, uh, for whatever reason, inclined to use heroin, whether it's because of depression or, uh, or other uh, reasons. Uh, we're not doing enough to actually address the public health crisis uh, that comes with uh, addiction and, and drug abuse. And that's where we, re we really need to reorient our efforts uh, and, and, and legalized access. Okay. to uh, methadone, to, to heroin, to other drugs may be part of the solution. All right. Now, let me bring Stephen on to this. Is the, is the solution much bigger? Even if we talk about how to protect journalists, the solution must be a much bigger holistic one that has to force us to review the whole war on drugs as a whole. What do you make of that argument, Stephen? Well, I think that process has begun, and I think David pointed out, I mean, there, there, there are experiments that are ongoing, not just in the United States, but also parts of Latin America, in some cases cities, in some cases entire countries, in the case of Uruguay. And I think we need to see how that plays out. I think there have been some positive signals, uh, some positive results from these, from these efforts. And we need to see how that plays out in the case of marijuana. But I think that we need to, I think your, your, your question implies this idea of, you know, compartmentalizing or breaking down the different pieces. And I think we need to do that. We need to go one step at a time here. Simultaneously, of course, we need to think about how we can reform justice systems. You know, how do we create the opportunity for, you know, many of these youths that are entering into this, uh, you know, terrible, um, you know, organized crime groups and street gangs, et cetera. So, yes, of course, it's a holistic approach. This process has begun. What, what, what we would hope uh, from our perspective, is that we don't get any reversals of this. And the indications we get from the Trump administration is that they would like to go back to 1985 and begin uh, to, you know, uh, bring us back to an era where, you know, it was punitive. Everything was uh, looked at as a punitive, right. uh, in a punitive way instead of a health way. So, so this is a very dangerous direction to turn in. All right, we've got about a, a minute and a half left, so I want to give it to Ambassador. In a minute and a half, give us your final thoughts on, on sure. that issue of how perhaps the solution is a much bigger holistic one. It is a much bigger, and I'm glad that you raised about uh, the heroin epidemic in the U.S. was begun by the pharmaceutical industry that kept on pushing for uh, prescribed pills that doctors were prescribing, and then when they stopped, people was, was already addicted, and that produced a huge problem. When I was an ambassador and we were reviewing those numbers, 95% of the addiction came from the uh, pharmaceutical industry, and then over 80% was uh, supplied by Afghanistan, and Mexico was supplying 5% of the heroin market. And that 5% had made a big, big problem down in Mexico. But that's what I said is so important to put things in context, Ben. All right. Well, it is a very complicated uh, problem. Let's hope that uh, politicians around the world will find a way to solve this one uh, so at least uh, journalists amongst others can do their jobs without fear. For now, let's thank our guests, Miguel Bastanez, David Shirk, and Stephen Dudley. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the show again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, head over to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle there is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Sami Zaydan, and the whole team here now, thanks for watching.